everyone by surprise, including revolutionaries themselves. Uh, however, an uprising is usually the climax of a process that has already been brewing um, in the years, if not decades before it. Uh, sometimes, um, um, I mean, this process is included in social and political struggles that uh, happen on different scales. Sometimes you can see them with your own eyes if they are big, like mass protests, mini uprisings that are happening here and there, uh, mass strikes. And sometimes you cannot see them because they are very small fights that are happening in neighborhoods scattered all over your country um, over access to services, over uh, uh, police brutality, over bread and butter issues. But it's the accumulation of dissent that finally leads uh, uh, to an uprising. Revolution, a revolution does not just suddenly happen out of the blue. Um, and this accumulation uh, process is not just an accumulation of dissent, it's also the accumulation of experience, the accumulation of, of hope. Um, revolutions, when they happen, they don't happen out of despair. They happen, I mean, this is unlike uh, the stereotype that, you know, people got really desperate, so they revolted. No, people revolt because they have hope that if they revolt, something positive might come out of it. Not everyone who takes part in a revolution um, have a complete picture of an alternative society, but they know that their act of revolt will inspire or will lead to something positive. Now, all what I've said right now might sound very obvious to you, might sound obvious to most of your uh, um, readers and listeners who are taking part um, in the online event today. But believe me, on the practical level, uh, not everyone understands this concept concretely. Um, even those who took part in a revolution. So for example, there is this wide, uh, um, I mean, widespread image that um, the Egyptian revolution happened because of a Facebook event that it was a Facebook revolution. Now, it is true that someone created a Facebook event um, for the January 25th, 2011 protests, but at the same time, this does not explain why the same event when it was created in 2010 and in 2009 and even 2008 did not lead to a revolt. When the same Facebook event was created in 2014, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, even till like few months, uh, as recent as few months, there were all of these Facebook events and online uh, calls for revolt, it did not yield any results. It's because such Facebook event was created at a time when the political scene matured enough that it was ready uh, uh, to respond for an uprising. This is something that revolutionaries like you and I and, and everyone who's taking part in this event must understand very concretely because the consequences of your actions will lead to drastic um, uh, developments if you don't understand where the class struggle uh, stands at. So for example, you risk looking like a fool like those who called for like, you know, I mean, a mass strike in Egypt on the 27th of September 2019 and no one showed up. Oh, and, and this has been repeated uh, uh, all over. So again, even when the uprising happens, the uprising itself is not the revolution. It is a phase of the revolution. So, um, I mean, many people refer to the 18 days in Tahrir Square that toppled Mubarak as the Egyptian revolution, but it was only a chapter in the revolt. And waves and waves would continue with fights, with victories and defeats um, until the dust settles either for the victory of the revolution or the counter-revolution. So the first lesson that we must always stress is that understand the scene, understand where the class struggle uh, uh, is standing at, and always give it time and context because things take time. 
uh, basically. Okay, thank you, Hassan. Um, then, um, what does that mean for revolutionaries uh, when we look at the state? So, how should we position or revolutionary position themselves towards the state uh, in their struggles? Uh, this is lesson number two, in my humble view. Uh, you cannot take over the state. Um, and this is one of the catastrophes. Uh, that led to the defeat of the first wave of the Arab revolutions in 2011 or from 2010 till 2013. Um, the leading organizations in the revolt, uh, most of them have been reformist organizations, uh, both on the Islamist and the secular uh, side. And both camps have been trying to seduce uh, the old regime or the state into supporting them, thinking that they can basically take over the existing uh, state machine and use it to achieve the goals of the revolution. So, for example, in, if you look at Egypt, um, which is a very classic example in that regards, uh, on January 28th, the Egyptian people managed to defeat the, um, uh, the central security forces. This is the army uh, or the paramilitary uh, uh, wing of the Egyptian police force. And it is in charge of uh, suppressing revolts and in charge of uh, uh, mass detentions, special operations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, after that catastrophic defeat for the police on January 28, 2011, all the political forces basically did not exploit the fact that the state was like hanging in the air and it was almost over. No, they all rushed in order to try to seduce whoever was left from, uh, from the regime officials and from the army leadership into their own side. Now, the first two years of the Egyptian revolution, the army sided um, with the Islamists who refused uh, to do any sort of purges or to, um, uh, or to restructure uh, uh, the political scene. So in the end, basically, uh, the state sold them out and they had a coup in 2013. Now, when I say you cannot take over the old state and you need to smash the state uh, um, and create a new one, now, this might trigger some images in the minds of people like, oh, you want anarchy, you want bloodshed, you want, um, uh, like, you know, you want to, to smash and destroy, like, you know, I mean, everything physically and then rebuild from scratch. No, it doesn't work this way. I mean, what is an institution? The institution, including state institutions, these are hierarchies and social positions. Um, if you end those social positions, uh, the state ends. So when you say that the current police force in Egypt uh, or that existed in Egypt up until today is not a force that's dedicated to uh, fighting crime uh, for public safety of the Egyptian people, but it is the force of the state in fabricating and enforcing uh, the social and political order that we have in Egypt, and to stop any attempts at changing it. So such police force cannot be reformed. Uh, even if you take out like, you know, I mean the big generals out of the scene and put like, you know, I mean new ones instead of them, it is still the same structure. You need to dissolve it and basically rebuild it uh, from scratch. And this is very easy to do during a revolt. Because if you talk about a revolution, this means that people are already in the streets and they are setting up uh, local committees for public uh, uh, safety and for other reasons. And this is something that's not uh, some abstract theory that we've read about. We've seen this with our own eyes in Egypt and elsewhere. Always the revolution carries the seeds for such alternative uh, institutions. So I would stress again that any sort of dependence on old institutions, what will lead in the end to one of two things. Either those old institutions will rebel against you 
in a very overt form, which is like a military coup that we've seen in Egypt, or basically the state will uh, suck all the uh, revolutionary energy and co-opt it and produce a different form of the regime with the same social and economic uh, uh, disparities and with the same policies, but with maybe a civilian face, not like a militarized uh, face. And this is something that unfortunately we're seeing now in Sudan. Um, and we've, we've seen also in Tunisia because people always talk about Tunisia being the only exception, you know, the only country that escaped, like, you know, I mean, the fate of the massacres and the defeats of the Arab Spring. Yes, I mean, no wide scale massacres happened in Tunisia, thank goodness. But at the same time, the regime managed to co opt such revolutionary tendencies. And what you have today is a more enhanced, more civilized version of the old regime. So again, I stress um, uh, the second lesson is that never trust the state, never trust the state institutions. You have to come up with an alternative uh, institutions during the revolt. And at the same time, not to throw your bets on any international state or any international actors uh, to intervene on your behalf. Uh, I know in some cases, like in Syria and, and Libya and elsewhere, you know, some factions of the opposition resorted to calling on, on, on the Western uh, uh, governments to intervene and using their military might. But I, I think this is, this is suicidal for any revolution. I mean, for, for, for two reasons. I mean, two obvious reasons. One is that the already existing dictatorship would not have existed without Western sponsoring and Western support all of these past decades. Secondly, the Western states itself, they have imperialist um, uh, goals and imperialist agenda in the region. And their intervention will never coincide uh, or intersect positively with the demands of the revolting masses. I'm not saying that we as Arabs that we don't have allies in the West, but you are our, our allies. Those people who are watching now, uh, this online event is our allies. Trade unionists are our allies. Student activists are our allies. Um, independent community organizers are our allies, but no allies exist within 10 Downing Street, within the White House, or within uh, any uh, uh, government uh, on the face of this earth. Actually, what we want to see is to replicate uh, such a revolutionary experience everywhere. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so bearing in mind what you just said, that uh, socialists cannot simply take over the state without provoking a coup or reproducing some for form of the old regime, and also bearing in mind that we a socialist should be wary of uh, state support. Um, what do you think, how should socialists then organize as revolutionaries in order to achieve what you also outlined, uh, namely dissolving the state and rebuilding it? Um, there was this optimism uh, in the beginning of the Arab Spring um, that spontaneity uh, would be enough that you know you talk to anyone about the need to establish a political organization or a political party for the revolutionaries and people will tell you well look you know if we have overthrown mubarak in 18 days like you know without any uh, uh like real intervention from the political parties uh look at the spontaneous revolts that are happening all over uh, spontaneity is enough and the people will protect the revolution but unfortunately, this is over -optimist, uh, optimistic uh, uh, view. Um, revolutionaries need to be organized. And they need to be organized not in, just in the midst of the revolution. They should be organized years in advance. Now, why is that? Uh, the history of capitalism uh, on the face of the earth is, I don't know, like what, roughly like 500 years? Um, if we count like the mercantile uh, uh, stage, but the history of labor uh, resistance and the history of our people's resistance is also 500 years old. We have an accumulated experience and we cannot keep on reinventing the wheel 
each time uh, a revolution happens and repeat the same mistakes of the past. You need a revolutionary fighting organization. And when I talk about fighting here, I don't mean literally like, you know, an armed organization, but I'm talking about a class fight. People who have read well the history uh, of social resistance, our own history, our real history, our history from below, and at the same time, they have, they have very good knowledge of, um, uh, of the mistakes that previous revolutions have fallen into. And a clear blueprint, I'm not saying a detailed plan, but a blueprint of what the alternative uh, uh, should be. And those those people would be embedded within the class. They are not like uh, some um, intellectuals in their ivory towers uh, who are just theorizing and writing, but they are people who are in the factories, who are um, in the squatter settlements, who are in the university uh, uh, campuses, who are in um, the civil servants' uh, uh, offices, and these people would lead the daily fights, the small fights that happen over bread and butter issues, whether you want to uh, a 15 minute toilet break, uh, or if you need like, you know, I mean, five euros, uh, uh, an extra pay. About these little bread and butter issues, and they would create for, their, for themselves roots in the population, within the class, so that when an uprising happens, they could present themselves as a legitimate uh, leadership. They are not parachuting uh, from the sky. And with these um, uh, people or with this network that you have created, this would be the network that basically when uh, people would say, okay, well, let's resort to the army generals to solve it. They would tell, no, 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 no. We've tried this in 2011, remember? It didn't work. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they have tried it in that country. It didn't work. They have tried it in Y country. It didn't work. However, if we do this, you know, this and, and go this other route, this might work. Um, so the problem of the Arab Spring in general, um, and I, 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 that it was a series of revolutions, but led by reformists, who at the end of the day, they were trying to negotiate the terms with the old state in different uh, uh, forms. So this organization, what are the tasks of these organizations? Once again, I mean, I've said it's to embed the memory of the class uh, and to accumulate the knowledge and the experience of the working class uh, in it, to lead on a daily basis uh, the small struggles that happen here and there and engage into not just like, you know, the big anti-imperialist political fights, but even in tiny battles, even over like a 15 minute toilet break, you know, the right to a 15 minute toilet break, you should be at the center uh, of that fight. Uh, the third thing is that what really protects um, uh, the capitalist system in, in, in its different forms and in whatever country is not just the bayonets and it's not just uh, the guns and the cannons. Um, it's, the, it's the hegemony uh, of ideas. And your political organization or the political organization we're striving to build should be the counter hegemonic force uh, in that fight. Uh, we are told all the time in Egypt that we've always been ruled by dictators because Egypt Egyptians love dictators. I mean, this is the kind of things that I would hear on campus when I was a student in the 1990s, you know, I mean, trying to organize. We've always been like, you know, I mean, ruled by the whip and that's how things are. Um, Egyptian people are not ready for democracy. This is like the famous saying of the Egyptian late spy chief, uh, Omar Suleiman in 2011, when he was asked by CNN, he said the Egyptian people are not ready for democracy. Um, you will find like people telling you like, you know, no revolutions ever had happened before. You know, this is like, you know, the kind of things that we would be hearing because our history is not there. We are presented with TV and cinema uh, films and books and state-run magazines and, and privately owned magazines also by uh, uh, businessmen that tells you whatever 
uh, horrible situation we're living in, this is the best uh, we can do uh, now. And you know what? We've always lived in that shitty situation and it will never change. So try to work with whatever you have. So this is the kind of organization that we should be striving to build before the revolt, uh, not in the midst of it. Thank you. Um, so I guess now we are jumping topics a bit, but you already touched upon uh, the portrayal of, of uh, political processes in the region in uh, especially Western media. And there is a lot of talk about Islamism and Islamists. Uh, could you elaborate a bit uh, on the question of Islamism and yeah, which role it played in, in the uprisings in the region? Um, as long as we do not have um, a clear uh, understanding of what Islamism is and a real class analysis of what Islamism is, we will continue to be um, in the same, uh, how would I describe, in the same pit for the rest of our lives, meaning um, who supported the coup in 2013 in Egypt that killed off the revolution? It was literally all the Egyptian leftist factions. <coughs> Excuse me. All the Egyptian leftist factions in 2013 supported the military takeover because the military is fighting fascism. Uh, these are fascist terrorists and we need to fight them. So they all stood uh, by the coup and they all cheered uh, the massacres, whether it's the Egyptian Communist Party or the, or the Egyptian Social Democratic Party or the Egyptian Socialist Alliance, most of the left-wing organizations, let alone the liberals, they supported this. Why? Because for them, Islamists are fascists. That's it. Um, in the case of Syria, for example, the regime very cleverly uh, framed the whole discourse into this is a war against takfiris, and, and, and it's a war against um, um, Islamist extremists who are like supported uh, by, I don't know, like, you know, I mean, foreign parties in order to uh, destabilize Syria. And, you know, with the whole images of ISIS, of course, and, you know, Jabhat al-Nusra, which was a former branch of Al-Qaeda, and all the other Islamist organizations, this was very tempting for many people around the world to say, oh my God, you know, I mean, no, the Syrians are fighting a war on terror. I will not uh, uh, support this. Hosni Mubarak managed to rule this country, you know, for 30 years, three decades. And one of his main um, um, corners and pillars for legitimacy was the fact that he's fighting terrorism. Uh, most of the Western governments would turn away, you know, and will pretend that they are not seeing the abuses that are happening uh, in the Arab world, and they will continue arming and supporting the dictatorships that we have in the name of fighting terrorism. So we have to um, go back, like, you know, I mean, two steps and look at the bigger picture. Number one, the biggest terrorists is the state. This is the biggest terrorist. Um, one bomb, one cluster bomb that from uh, the Egyptian Air Force on a location in Sinai would kill 10 times whatever, like, you know, I mean, ISIS has been trying to do. Um, the amount of bloodshed that has been happening in Egypt and in elsewhere on the hands of the armies and the security services cannot be compared anything uh, to the Islamists. And this is not to defend uh, the Islamist actions. But I'm saying that we have to um, come to an understanding of the phenomena in front of us so as to be able to relate to it. The, we cannot lump all Islamists in one uh, uh, basket. There are different tendencies within it, just like the left. There are different tendencies uh, on the left. And we, we raised the slogan as Egyptian revolutionary socialists, and this didn't like, you know, I mean, the rest of the left was not really enthusiastic about this, is that we are sometimes with the Islamists, but never with the state. Sometimes we will find ourselves on the same uh, common ground as Islamists in some cases where, um, for example, the, 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 like what would happen if the police goes and torture like an Islamist to death? How would you stand? 
what's your position? I mean, at, at that time, would you say, oh, well, you know, I mean, the, the police was fighting a, a fascist, or was interrogating a fascist, so screw him or screw her, you know, let them like, you know, I mean, rot? Or would you say that, no, I stand against police brutality, uh, I stand against um, the police and the state's actions of suppressing political dissent of any shape, but at the same time, I disagree with the Islamists over X, Y, and Z. Like, you don't have to give up your organizational and ideological independence. You have to raise your red flag all the time. Your ideas should be present uh, in front of uh, everybody uh, at all time. But there will be occasions where you will have to share uh, the same ground uh, with Islamists when it comes to fighting the state. Never resort to, 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 to the military tank in order to solve your problems uh, with other uh, uh, social forces. Um, I tell my leftist comrades that, you know, I mean, the people would be the criteria. The people will have the final say. The Islamists are presenting their own uh, ideas, and we should also present our own ideas. And it's the people in the end who would give uh, support to whoever party that they think are much more reasonable and much more um, um, responsive uh, to the demands that they have in their heads and the goals of the revolution. But never resort to the military tank and to the armed officer to come so as to be on, on your side, like, you know, I mean, versus the Islamists. That's one of the main reasons why the first wave of the Arab uh, revolutions got defeated. <clears throat> everybody, excuse me, everybody rushed to the so-called secular military in order to defend us against, like, you know, I mean, those people who are, like, reactionary and want to get us, like, you know, I mean, back to the medieval age. Well, look at what we are now. We are already in the medieval age, thanks to the military. Yeah, uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so maybe now uh, let's come back to the question of what there is to be done practically. So when we talked before, you said that it seems to you uh, that it seems uh, that for revolutionaries, there are basically two options. It's either the street or the ballot box. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on what you mean by that and then also point out what's your take on it? Um, what I, this is actually one of the most important lessons uh, that I personally also, I mean, le learned um, um, throughout this uprising. Uh, I don't want the audience to think that I'm trying to patronize them. Like, you know, I mean, with anything, when I talk about like, you know, I mean, the lessons learned that you have to listen, uh, you have to learn this lesson or not. Because these are lessons that I personally also, I mean, learned and learned the hard way, you know, I mean, through a defeated revolution. Um, the street and the ballot box, in the same way that's, that many people were over optimistic um, in the beginning of the revolution, that spontaneity would just lead, you know, I mean, for the revolution to succeed and it's enough. Many people also, uh, especially among uh, the radical youth, were against taking part in any elections uh, that were presented. Uh, uh, during the revolutionary process, like the first three years of the revolution before the coup, because no, uh, the ballot box, like, you know, I mean, kills the revolution. Um, uh, the ballot box is a ploy by the regime and by the army or by the Islamists. And the street is always the solution. But this is an ultra leftist position um, that I personally was also guilty of on occasions uh, in the revolution. Um, and you should not leave any inch without fighting over it and not seceding it to the counter revolution. So yes, you can mobilize in the streets and the revolution will be won uh, in the streets, but a revolution is accumulation of battles. And one, of, and one of those battles will happen around the ballot boxes. Um, 
whether it's like parliamentary elections, whether it's even like, you know, presidential uh, elections. Now we as socialists, we definitely have a different alternative, a different vision of what a state should look like, of, of direct democracy, of the working class control uh, over the means of production. But at the same time, in order to reach this, there are battles and twists and turns that we have to go through until we reach it in the end. Um, so we should not act in an elitist fashion when it comes to the ballot box, um, thinking that, like many anarchists also, which I have immense respect for, you know, but, you know, the anarchists on principle, like, you know, most of them, they, they boycott elections. But I think that if the people go to the ballot boxes, you should not leave the people um, uh, uh, seceding uh, any ground for the counter-revolution. And you should always create a battle uh, with your own revolutionary propaganda and agitation around even those uh, reformist uh, structures. So ultra-leftism um, is a disease that we should always try to confront during a revolution. Um, if the consciousness of the people are, is at a certain level, you know, you, you always try to act as a vanguard, but you shouldn't be here. You know, you should always be like, you know, I mean, as close as you are with the people trying to bring them up, you know, I mean, to the level of consciousness that you think they should reach. Um, and you will be amazed because sometimes they will even manage to outdo you and to have like, you know, I mean, a, an even more progressive consciousness. But do not boycott the ballot boxes unless there was an alternative. Um, I can boycott elections if there was basically like, you know, I mean, uh, two million people in Tahrir Square and millions in the other uh, 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 squares in Egypt who are demanding a much more radical. Um, uh, alternative. But if there are no millions in the streets, and that's like the only thing that's being presented at that point, uh, uh, an election, then you should take part. You should not boycott it and act in an ultra leftist way. So I think these are like just five main general points um, that I have personally learned from this revolt. And um, I guess, you know, I mean, we can take questions and I can answer your audience. Yes. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> let me start by the 30th of June um, uh, protests. Um, and uh, the first comrade, uh, I mean, who spoke, um, and he basically was trying to explain, uh, the comrade from Frankfurt, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name now. Uh, and he was like trying to explain the situation where um, a revolutionary um, uh, woman, the Egyptian revolutionary woman that he knew was like enthusiastic for it while others were torn. And he was also um, in a disbelief, like, you know, I mean, how did uh, some people in our tendency uh, <clears throat> or like, you know, I mean, on the radical left, people from our own tradition, uh, stood by those uh, protests. Um, my answer is the following, like being in a revolution and being in the midst of events, especially that if it's like the first revolution that you see and you witness and you go through in your life, you're bound to make mistakes. Um, sometimes these mistakes are catastrophic. Um, it's not enough that you would be well-versed um, in uh, Marxist uh, philosophy and strategy and tactics, and you have read the theory really well. Uh, part of it is also has to do with your own experience, with uh, how much roots you have in the ground. Um, I mean, and many other factors. The situation was indeed very confusing for so many people. Um, even including uh, ourselves as revolutionary socialists in Egypt, and I'll come to that in a minute, um, you suddenly had like millions uh, who were taking part uh, in that revolt or in that uh, revolt, like, you know, I mean, quote unquote, in 30th of June. And 
such mass mobilization was happening after an entire year of like, you know, anti-Morsi mobilization that was not completely staged by the military and the counter-revolution. Part of the mobilizations were really authentic by people who uh, took part in the revolution, believed in its ideals, and had high expectations, you know, I mean, uh, 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 regarding Morsi. And now we've elected, you know, the president of the revolution. Why isn't he delivering? And this year, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood rule was not uh, a good year at all in terms of achieving the goals of the revolution. So people like us, for example, the revolutionary socialists in Egypt, we took part in the 30th of June protests, but we raised the slogan at the time, uh, like down with all those who betrayed the revolution, the military, uh, the fulul, fulul are like a remnants of the old regime, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So we were taking part in the mobilization as anti-military and anti-Muslim Brotherhood. And to be honest, this was a very naive uh, uh, position. And we went through self-criticism uh, uh, later. But we did not support the coup, um, I mean, on the 3rd of July. We did not support the so-called tafweed, the authorization that CC asked from the public so as to fight terrorism. We, uh, we stood against the post-coup uh, government from day one. And at the same time, we also denounced the massacres uh, that happened in July and August and afterwards at a time when the Egyptian left was like cheering it. So I can understand the confusion because the situation was very complicated uh, uh, at the time. However, going back at it, one has to be brave and criticize uh, himself um, uh, over the positions that were uh, taken uh, because the 30th of June basically, I mean, signaled like the end of the revolution. Um, there is no, there is no like, you know, uh, maneuver around uh, uh, that fact. Um, Frank uh, raised a, a very important point regarding the working class. Um, part of, I mean, the revolution and fighting a revolution is that you fight over the discourse. And from day one, the counter-revolution and the regime have tried to frame um, uh, the narrative as a youth revolt, uh, a revolt of dignity. Um, it's done by those social media savvy middle-class kids. Um, um, and, and this is very sinister. Um, First, the working class had a central role uh, before and during uh, the revolution. As I said, my first lesson uh, to be learned was that a revolution is a process. And in the case of Egypt, this process took a decade. It started from the year 2000 with the pro-Intifada or the uh, Intifada solidarity protests in Egypt that turned by 2002, 2003 into the anti-war movement. Uh, against the bombing of Iraq and the occupation of Iraq. And then in 2004, 2005, 2006, this metamorphosed into an anti-Mubarak movement that was called Enough, uh, Kifaya. But starting from December 2006, that's when the working class made its strong entry into the political scene by their mass strikes in the textile sector, uh, to be more specific, um, uh, Mahalla, which is in the heart of the Nile Delta and had the third largest textile mill in the world. Um, and since then, the curve of the strikes has been going up, 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 to till you basically reach the revolution. Um, and during the 18 days, the revolution was not just an occupation of Tahrir Square. Uh, actually, if, if it was only Tahrir Square, Mubarak could have gotten away with it. Um, and ha would have stored the situation till basically the occupation would fizzle. But starting from the 5th of February, uh, 2011, all the way till the downfall of Mubarak on the 11th of February, this is, I mean, wh why did he fall? It was basically because of the mass strikes uh, that happened. If it wasn't for these mass strikes, that was in literally in every single sector in Egypt. 
in every single government civil servant's office. Everyone was on strike. And that's when the military had to step in and intervene and depose Mubarak, uh, or else the whole system would collapse. So the working class, I mean, played a central role in paving the way uh, to uh, January 2011. And during the revolt itself, it was thanks to their mass strikes that Mubarak was toppled. And these strikes, by the way, continued uh, afterwards in waves, ups and downs, ups and downs. And these strikes were the target of attack by the state as soon as Mubarak fell. Um, it, it was presented as sabotage. It was presented as chaos. It was presented as those people want to stop the wheel of production. Uh, if you are a true rev revolutionary, you should focus more on the political process and the constitution and, uh, and drafting like, you know, I mean, the new government, but not uh, the streets. But it was thanks to those workers that the spirit of the revolution continued uh, uh, with us. They were demanding, like, I mean, their own economic uh, rights that fall within the sphere of social justice. And this is like one of the main uh, slogans uh, of the revolution. Secondly, most of these strikes were directed also against the management of the public sector companies and, and also the directors of some private companies, all of whom belong to the old regime. So they were trying to purge their institutions uh, from the remnants of the old regime. And they succeeded in some cases, they failed on, on other cases. But in general, the liberals um, and the Islamists and large sections also of the left were dismissive um, uh, of these strikes. But in my humble view, it's these strikes that one should have thrown his or her entire weight uh, behind in order to save the revolution. Um, regarding the question of repression in Egypt and I mean, what to do in this situation, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean it's never an easy ride. Uh, it's never easy. Um, um, in Egypt, since the coup in 2013, everything went down the drains. I mean, uh, most political parties have been destroyed. Most of the youth movements uh, had been destroyed or contained. Um, you have more than 60,000 political prisoners. Now in Egypt, thousands have been killed uh, in the suspension of the strikes and the protests after uh, the coup. Um, everything became much more militarized. Independent unions have been crushed uh, or completely bureaucratized or dissolved. So. It's not an easy situation for sure in Egypt, uh, and hence any calls for an uprising now in Egypt is completely ludicrous uh, uh, at the moment. Like, you know, you can go and create a zillion Facebook events uh, for, for protests now, but you know, I mean, good luck with that. I mean, no one was gonna show up. So this is what you get when a revolution is defeated. And it will take time before people start gaining the confidence to reorganize again and to push for a margin to organize freely in. Uh, I've been through a similar situation before, but it was not a defeated revolution. But the 1990s in Egypt, when, when I was a student, it was a semi-similar uh, atmosphere of terror. Um, and it was only uh, uh, with the Palestinian Intifada in 2000 that, you know, that threw a rock in a stagnant water and started like steering it. So it will take several years uh, for us in order to regain momentum uh, once again. This process could be accelerated by the victory of any revolution or any mass movement in the region that could provide an inspiring example for Egyptians. When I started my talk, uh, uh, like roughly an hour ago, I was saying that revolution is a process and it includes accumulation of dissent and accumulation of hope. There has to be hope. I mean, at the moment, Sisi has lost most of his legitimacy. You know, he doesn't have the popularity that he has in 2014. Okay. But most of the Egyptian people, you know, do not really have hope as 2011 that if they take to the streets, the outcome would be different than what they have seen. 
So such revival of the confidence and such a revival of hope and the revival of the mass movement, it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen uh, uh, that quick. And our role is to respond to what is happening and try to organize even in the midst of, of the oppression. But such organization would be different. I mean, there were times in 2011 where you can hold a protest in the midst of Tahrir Square. Now you can't. It would be crazy if you try to do something like that. So you resort to other uh, modus operandi without, go without getting into details. Now, uh, two more uh, points I'll try to wrap up quickly. Uh, one about uh, Islamism. I'm not here trying to say that Islamists are angels. And I'm not trying to say that Islamists are uh, a progressive force that one has to uh, always like, you know, I mean, seek an alliance, you know, I mean, with. I am saying this is the elephant in the room that you cannot ignore, okay? And you either have to come up with a political strategy to deal with the Islamists who are not going anywhere. And if you uh, resort, you know, I mean, to the CC style of, uh, uh, of solutions, which is like go and exterminate, you know, I mean, everything. Now you will end up with the situation we are in today in Egypt, that everyone is actually exterminated, not just the Islamists. I mean, let alone that what, I mean, the targeting even of the reformist Islamists turned them into radicals, radicals in the jihadi uh, sense, which is even more catastrophic. So if you adopt the slogan, sometimes with the Islamists, never with the state, you will be able to maneuver uh, uh, well and take the correct positions. Um, you should always try to reach the base cadres of the Islamists. Okay, Most of these base cadres of the Islamists haven't seen any respectable alternative to their movements. Okay, You can basically try to present uh, 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 a different uh, uh, alternative to them. Um, uh, last question about uh, the German Revolution and about, uh, I mean, the parliament. I, I don't want to get into details now. I mean, trying to uh, reflect on the German Revolution. This is, I mean, it needs like, you know, a, a lecture in itself. And I'm sure that you have more information about the subject, I mean, better uh, than me. But at least I'm saying that in the case of the events that I have witnessed in the region, such elitist approach to the ballot box, okay, has cost us a lot. If you, I mean, for example, uh, uh, an Islamist is running versus um, uh, the, the official representative of the counter revolution. Would you say, oh, the two are bad, so I'm boycotting it? You know, if the representative of the counter revolution wins, he will have the mandate to crush everything unlike the reformist, reactionary Islamist. Okay, I'm not saying that the Islamist here is like, you know, necessarily a good guy. Um, so I would say that never miss a chance uh, to, to fight for any inch in order to further uh, the revolutionary agenda. Sorry for taking uh, too long. Thank you, Hassam. And um, yeah, now we have Dina and then I have also- um, Regarding the, the question of the network, um, what I meant is that we have to invest uh, our energies and our time and all our efforts and resources into building uh, this network before the, the revolution happens. And Definitely, it's not going to be a mass success before the revolution happens. This network will always be um, uh, under attack, whether it's under attack security-wise or under attack uh, uh, politically. And by the regime media outlets, there will be arrests, there might be killings, there might be long prison sentences. I mean, sacrifices will be made. But this network has to be built years before the revolution. And it's built in a struggle, meaning like, you know, it's built in small struggles. Uh, those who fight over uh, a 12 Egyptian pounds increase in food allowance in a textile factory, you know. Your comrades should be at the top or at the vanguard uh, of that fight. Um, 
a fight over uh, a university campus need needs for um, an ambulance service to be present. This is something completely reformist. You don't, you don't need a socialist revolution, you know, to provide an ambulance car, you know, I mean, on a university campus. But such reformist uh, struggles, you have to, as a revolutionary, lead them uh, uh, before the revolt. So that when the revolution happens, you are already in shape. You are already, you have roots in most of the important working class centers and in student uh, uh, um, um, uh, communities so that you can provide some leadership from below for the uprising. Now, in the midst of a revolution, whatever it takes you years to establish before the revolution, in the midst of the revolution itself, it can happen within days. So like, you know, I mean, you can stay for 20 years, you know, as a small group of like few hundreds, but suddenly in the midst of a revolution, you'll find that you said that you are growing exponentially into thousands and tens of thousands. So, and this also comes, you know, I mean, with a cost uh, that can dilute your politics, can get you into all sorts of political uh, uh, distortions. So the bigger and the most and, and the more organized you are before the revolution, you know, the better you will perform. Uh, and not just the better you perform, I mean, there will be more chances at the success of a revolution uh, if, if there was this uh, revolutionary network. Um, there is something about elections and about smashing the state and about the deep state that I probably need to clarify. These elections, it's not like I'm a revolutionary and I am calling for these parliamentary elections to happen. These parliamentary elections are scheduled by the regime or by the transitional government or by the army. It's because I didn't have enough resources and an enough network of cadres and enough political support so as to finish this off on the 28th of January, 2011, the Friday of anger. That's like the day when basically the whole police was smashed and the state was like left hanging in the air. Now, if I was a mass revolutionary organization uh, at the time and the level of consciousness among the people have reached a very high level at the time, I mean, game over. I mean, the whole, the, the revolution would have succeeded by then, but, I'm not, I'm in the minority. And I'm not the one who's running the show. I'm not the one who's directing the events in the streets. So what if an elections are held, you know, in the midst of this, what should I do as a revolutionary? You know, should I say, no, I mean, I'm not gonna participate in anything like this because, you know, I mean, this is a ploy by the counter revolution and the deep state to, to uh, suck the revolutionary energy and finish it off. In, in my humble view, I know others might disagree, I would say, no, you have to participate. This is a battle that has been um, imposed on you. It's not like you asked for it. So in that case, you will take part uh, in elections and try to turn the ballot box into uh, a, a battle. Uh, the memory of the class, regarding the question uh, by Grania, I think, uh, about the memory of the class, uh, the memory of the class is a very figurative uh, description that I have uh, borrowed from Trotsky when he was basically referring to the Revolutionary Party, when he's saying that the Revolutionary Party is the memory uh, of the class. You can translate this physically as much as you want into like physical things as much as you want, uh, whether it's like, you know, oh, I'm gonna have like, you know, I mean, a publishing house that uh, produces like, you know, I mean, the real history of Egypt from below, I will have my own network that can distribute like, you know, I mean, underground leaflets and underground uh, newsletters and newspapers that have a different view of our history from below. I can have maybe an online uh, media uh, uh, presence that can provide uh, a different uh, alternative view from below. It's, I mean, everyone according to their own situation can adapt this whole figurative concept of the memory of the class. But the most important thing is that you would have the enough cadres and the enough network on the ground 
that can transfer this memory of the class to others. So you should not just be content with having a Facebook page that's like being followed by like 50,000 people, let's say, or thousands or even millions. Okay, well now I've created the memory of the class. I have a Facebook page that's followed by many people and I could just post things on it. No, propaganda and agitation, they go hand in hand uh, for any revolutionary fighting uh, organization. Um, regarding the term ultra left, I mean, I would refer you to um, <clears throat> Um, to Lenin's uh, famous booklet. It's called uh, um, uh, Left-Wing Communism, uh, Infantile Disorder. I'm translating the name from Arabic, uh, but I hope I got the official title uh, right. Uh, where basically, I mean, <clears throat> Lenin was into polemics with the Germans, with the German communists mainly at the time, uh, over the issue of elections. And according to him, um, what factions of the German movement was doing was ultra leftist, that they were taking, not like a radical leftist situation, but they were taking a very elitist, kind of like very extremist uh, view of the situation that did not touch upon reality. And he warned that there will be terrible consequences because of that. And I think it turned out to be right. So I would refer you to Lenin's uh, booklet um, as a startup point to read about um, the ultra left uh, in general. Uh, regarding the question about unemployment, I know that the unemployed played a role uh, or like they have been active in, in organizing uh, in Morocco and in Tunisia um, uh, prior to the revolution. And in Morocco, like, you know, throughout the years, the unemployed were uh, very active uh, in that regards. But uh, in the case of Egypt, um, I would say that the unemployed did not really constitute a social movement um, that was as clear and as concrete as the case of the textile workers, uh, for example, as the case of, I mean, other uh, social movements that exist. So, but obviously the question of unemployment in general has been one of the, um, um, the explosive issues that led to this revolution in the end. It was part of the package of social justice uh, uh, in Egypt. Um, there is um, a question, uh, yeah, regarding Phil's uh, point about uh, the German left and the exiles, we are living in, in very interesting times. Uh, Berlin now has become what we call like, you know, I mean, the capital of, of the Arab exiles uh, in general, or maybe the term Arab here is not that accurate since, I mean, you find exiles from Iran, Iranians are not Arabs, by the way, <laughs> do not fall into this mistake. Uh, you find exiles from, uh, I mean, Turkey, you find exiles actually from all over uh, the Middle East region. And this has been building up uh, over the past years uh, in terms of the community presence. Uh, how, how successful the German left has been in terms of liaising and reaching out to this community, I don't think um, it has been that successful, unfortunately. Um, and I'm just saying this out of like very superficial, you know, I mean, knowledge, me as an observer and me as an Arab exile, uh, I mean, here in Berlin. I think part of it has to do with the um, uh, long tradition that the German left had when it comes to uh, supporting Zionism and supporting the Israeli state on the expense of uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, rights and Arab rights in general. And this has translated itself into some racist attitudes uh, towards Arabs. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I got attacked and my friends got attacked at, at protests. Uh, that, that were like, you know, I mean, left-wing protests over a variety of issues for simply wearing, you know, I mean, uh, a Palestinian scarf. I mean, so, I mean, if it comes down to something as simple as this, you know, so you can imagine the level of political marginalization that we are uh, living under. Uh, secondly, uh, most of the factions of the German left, um, they are looking at the Arab exiles um, as an asset only during elections, uh, how we can translate, you know, I mean, this into votes in the end. 
which I mean it I mean it could be useful on occasions, but it's a different sort of politics than the one that you and I um, are trying to push forward uh, uh, here. Uh, the politics of uh, self-emancipation, the politics of uh, struggle from below. Um, I mean, again, I'm against boycotting the parliament and I'm against boycotting uh, um, whatever forms or that exist under capitalist democracies. Um, but at the same time, we will not achieve socialism via those uh, structures in the end. So I think, I mean, as a start, um, the German left needs to have a very clear position uh, regarding the Palestinian cause. I think this will continue to be a huge obstacle towards uh, liaising with the Arab community and the Arab exiles and the Middle Eastern exiles uh, uh, in general uh, here. Uh, secondly, um, factions of the German left are getting seduced by the whole shift to the, uh, to the right and in this whole immigration debate. I mean, when you find people in Dilinka, you know, itself, like, you know, I mean, talking about the threat of the migrants and, you know, I mean, immigration controls and other things. I mean, obviously, I mean, we have an issue here. Uh, I will... I would never put my hands in them. I mean, they regard me as someone who is undesirable uh, in the end. So when, when there is a very concrete and solid position reached regarding the issue of Palestine and regarding the issue of immigration, at least this is a starting point uh, uh, towards uh, engaging with the Arab community. And then it will be followed uh, by others. Um, Regarding, um, I mean, again, I mean, the, the, the point that was raised by uh, Christina uh, regarding the German government, the German government is one of the biggest trading partners with uh, CC. Uh, the, we are like, um, I mean, I think the second or the first uh, importers of um, uh, German arms. Um, I mean, I'm talking here about Egypt. Uh, Germany is uh, cooperating with the security services in Egypt, even when officially uh, this uh, security agreement was was kind of like stopped two years ago, thanks to the pressures uh, here. But there is security cooperation that's still happening. The Germans are selling uh, military submarines uh, to Egypt and all sorts of other arms. Um, I mean, as a start, you can try to lobby. Uh, your own government into stopping these arms sales. It's not an easy campaign, of course, because money talks in the end, and this is a capitalist government, no matter how humanitarian uh, uh, it tries to pretend at the end of the day. But it is uh, after profit. Um, so you can lobby your own government into stopping uh, the flow of arms. You can lobby your own government into actually withdrawing the German military presence from our region. Uh, as I was talking earlier, I'm, I'm against any sort of intervention uh, by the armies or by the states uh, into the affairs of the people in, in this region. And if you manage to do this, and of course to fight against immigration controls, these are three things that the German left can do here and you can, and you will be benefiting uh, our cause. Uh, the last point, and sorry for taking up so long, about the new wave of revolts um, and their impact on Egypt. Again, because revolution is a process, so whatever happened in Algeria uh, last year and in Sudan last year and in Lebanon and Iraq, they, although they took everybody by surprise, but if you were like following the situation and monitoring it very um, uh, accurately and very closely, you will find that there was already dissent, you know, I mean, brewing in the previous years till it reached, you know, I mean, the climax. And from following on the reactions of Egyptians, I mean, some people felt like, you know, I mean, extremely enthusiastic and they went on trying to replicate whatever happened in Sudan just right away uh, by issuing, like, you know, I mean, calls for protests that, of course, ended in tears and ended in mass arrests, and it wasn't a good idea at all, because this is not 2011, 
and the domino effect plays differently. But these social movements will impact Egypt in a positive way, not uh, immediately, but on the medium term and on the long term, they will benefit uh, uh, the Egyptian movement. Again, I was, um, when I was referring earlier to the level of catastrophic defeat that we have witnessed in Egypt after 2013, I was saying that it will take years for the revival to happen, but this could be accelerated by the success or by the outbreak of other social events and social uh, movements in the region that will inspire Egyptians with hope that if they take to the streets again, we don't have to end up like whatever happened in 2013. We don't have to end up like, you know, I mean, the boogeyman that everyone is using like Syria or like Libya. Actually, there are social movements that are happening and they are achieving victories and we could be uh, similar. So again, it's not going to have a direct impact now, but in the medium term, it will. Okay, Hossam, thank you very much for your analysis and also uh, yeah, your outlook and also the, the regional um, uh, uh, view on these processes. Um, so before we end this meeting, I'd like to um, yeah, highlight again that uh, this event took place in the course of our Marxist Mus Congress and uh, Ramsey posted the upcoming events uh, in the chat. So if you want to um, uh, yeah, take part in those, uh, we'd be very happy.